Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, YouTubers. This is Jerry Diamond. How to get out of Babylon. Um, got another little video out there, just, just a shorty, a little rant, flat earth rant, so I'm not going to talk about that this time. Summertime, A.T. Hagen's. We interrupt this program. And yeah, the break in Branson kind of threw me off. Uh, four days, five days, I don't know, I just was like wiped out. And other things going on is, you know, uh, so I, I apologize for that. I'll try to stay on track here, get this one finished, and then I'm going to look at the repertoire of things and see if I want to do this again or, you know, redo a, something like Lights Out. So, all right. Summertime, part one. John went down the hallway knocking on doors and saying, time to get up. Last one up gets no hot water. Which was the truth. Their old hot water was, heater was beginning to show its age from 10 months of higher than normal usage and was no longer responding as fast as it once did, even with half of the family bathing at night. At the end of the hall, he went into his room and handed his wife her coffee. She stretched and yawned and looked blurrily over the rim of her cup as she took a sip. Is it really necessary to be up at 4.30 on a weekend, John? She asked grumpily. Her husband grinned and poked her in the ribs, causing her to squirm and nearly spill her coffee. This is a working farm, woman. You get to sleep late on Sundays, at least till dawn anyways. We've all got all the usual morning chores to get through and the truck loaded and be on the road in time to set up and ready to go for the 7.30 market open. Most of the business gets done in the first two hours, so if you're late, you're out of luck. Better hop to it. The kids can't get their baths until you've had yours. Anne got up, taking another sip of her coffee, and stare, started moving, stared, said started, started moving towards the bathroom, muttering grump, grump, grump as she went. In the kitchen, Heather was putting the water on for the grits and beginning to mix the biscuits. She was visiting them for a week after having a fallout with her mother over her school and social life. For all of her complaining about raising livestock, John thought she missed the farm atmosphere and the large family feeling. With the household grudgingly forcing itself into motion, he slipped on his hat and went out the kitchen door towards the greenhouse, where the truck was backed up and ready to load. It was past the traditional time for starting gardens in North Florida, but since the impact, there had been a gardening boom like he had not, had not been seen at least since the Second World War with its victory gardens. As a result, they had not been able to keep up with the demand for vegetable bedding plants, much to their delight since they had made a fair profit from the trade. The usual hot Florida June weather had also not materialized. The highs were still only reaching the low 80s, which was making for very productive gardens, which he felt might account for part of the newfound interest in growing your own food. That and a difficult winter of getting anything to eat that one could afford. In the greenhouse, he began slipping the trays of starch onto the racks, into the racks in the back of the truck. He worked steadily and soon had all the seedlings loaded. He pulled the truck around to the barn and hooked up the stock trailer that would carry the eggs and produce, then pulled around in front of the workshop where the goods were waiting to be loaded. All of their new chickens were laying now, in addition to their older birds, so they now gathered, washed, and packed 240 eggs a day. Whatever, 200 eggs a day. They sold them all, too, every weekend at the market, except for the 25 dozen he sold to Miguel. Those were wholesale, so they made less profit on them, but John felt it prudent to have more than one outlet for their goods, so wrote off the lost profit as insurance. He'd found a good source for ordering new egg cartons and had them custom printed with the Horn Farm label that Cindy had designed. So far, they were selling very well, and John was beginning to consider expanding into one of the farmer's markets in Gainesville where they'd reach a more affluent clientele. First into the trader went four crates of live roosters, now all prime eating size. He was somewhat surprised by the number of live birds they sold, but it seemed that Gainesville's large ethnic population not only had no problem with butchering their own birds, many preferred to. This was fine by him because he'd never cared for plucking chickens and did so only as a necessity of disposing of spent hens and surplus cockerels. He laid a pre-cut piece of plywood down on top of the eggs, then loaded cases of eggs, another layer of plywood, and in with the vegetables. They didn't sell as much produce as many others did, mostly 
just a surplus from what they didn't eat or preserve themselves. Next year he figured to perfect, perhaps expand that area once he'd had a chance to study it a while. He was just finishing with the last of the produce when he saw Melinda and Cindy come out of the house, heading for the barn, one to milk dandelion, the other to feed the rest of the livestock. After discussing the matter with Anne, they decided to allow the children to set their own schedules for who milked, who fed, and when it would be done with the proviso that it had to be done regularly, the same time, every day, and without fail. Lapses would be sternly corrected by mass denial of privileges which served to motivate everyone to make sure no one individual was slacking off. So far it was working well. Since the kids set the schedules up themselves, they could not complain about having to meet them, and it allowed them to negotiate amongst themselves when one needed to deviate from what had already been agreed upon. The only impact that John made on this was that morning chores had to be done before the truck left on market days, thus the girls coming out for a 5.30 a.m. milking and feeding rather than the 7 o'clock operation that they'd normally perform. With their sale goods loaded, he then set the boxes of table coverings and display materials on top so they would come out first. He found much of their display to be rather kitschy in a country sort of way, even outright corny, but he had to admit that it was effective in attracting potential customers to their tables. Anne, Lisa, and the girls had spent much time in their first several working market days studying whose tables were drawing customers and deducing why. They'd even gone and visited the farmers markets in Gainesville to research there as well. Cornball sold produce, so cornball is what they presented. They'd even developed what Anne had come to call their farming uniforms of coveralls, straw hats, red bandanas hanging out of their rear pockets, and plaid shirts. John found the whole thing to be somewhat embarrassing, but it drew customers. It was a strange old world sometimes. With everything loaded and ready to go, he went back into the house. Heather, Brittany, and Neil were just setting food on the table. He washed his hands at the kitchen sink, and as he was sitting to the table, Cindy and Mel came in with the morning's milk, which they set in the refrigerator to separate. John say, gave the grace, and the family set to their meal. As he was buttering a biscuit, Ann said, There was a story on the NPR News a few minutes ago that J.P. Morgan announced yesterday after the market closing they were going into bankruptcy. The market analyst they were interviewing said he thought there was a strong chance that Citibank and Bank America would go under as well. He also said he thought the FDIC might not be able to meet its obligations concerning insured accounts unless Congress authorizes more funds. Do you think we should do something about this? John took a bite of his biscuit and thoughtfully for a moment, chewed thoughtfully for a moment before replying, Darling, there's just not much we can do about it. We've known for a couple of months there was going to be a slaughter in the financial community. Looks to me like they finally hit a point they can't conceal it or starve it off, stave it off any longer. We have to deal with banks because that's what the state insists on paying its employees and the military for theirs. If the banks go poof, then we'll just have to get by as best we can. We're already doing half our trade in barter as it is. If we have to, I guess we'll barter the other half as well. It's a clumsy way to do business, but it beats not doing business at all. The government doesn't have any real choice in the matter if they don't want the entire economy to collapse. Congress will simply have to authorize the funds to cover those insured bank accounts, which means they'll tell the Treasury to roll the presses to pay for it and raise taxes at the same time. Leastways, they'll try to raise taxes anyway. The national mood being what it is, they may soon find out that to be too dangerous a solution for any politician to try. But they'll roll those presses as sure as I'm sitting here. That means our national debt will balloon even more than it already has, and we're going to see inflation shooting up again. About all we can do is pull any money we have out of the banks as fast as we can and keep as much of our assets in tangible goods as possible. No way to entirely get out of dealing with cash, money. The government wants its taxes in cash, power company, phone company, and so on. Most everyone else we can probably work out some sort of deal with. Eventually, the rest of the financial infrastructure that was damaged by the impact is going to crash. When the dust settles, the government will be able to start building a sound currency again that we can rely on not to inflate into worthlessness before you can get into town to spend it. Until then, we just hunker down and wait it out like everyone else. All right. Good night.